Good evening. Welcome to a Bible study. Before we begin, I'll try and, as always, in prayer. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we are grateful that we still have the opportunity to meet together and to read your word and to consider the things, the great and wonderful things that it says to us. We ask that you may help us as we look at the book of Romans in this passage before us in Romans chapter 8. Such a glorious uh, chapter such glor- and such glorious things to consider. And Heavenly Father, that these things might be a great encouragement to us and a help to us and uh, for our good, for our strengthening, we pray. <coughs> be with our pastor in the Philippines and all of the messages that he will be giving over these weeks and those that he has already given. We thank you uh, for them. We do indeed uh, pray for our time together this evening, though, that our hearts might be lifted up to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, our hymn is number 587, Now I Have Found the Ground Wherein, (coughs) and uh, we're familiar with the tune. So let us stand to sing. Now I have found the Yeah. 
Well, if you like to turn in your Bibles to the letter to the Romans, Romans in chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and we'll read the entire chapter. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we are saved, we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, that he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. 
whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wonderful passage. And we're going to consider those final closing verses from verse 31 to 39, God willing, over this week and next week. And we're going to look at these verses in light of the theme of this chapter. And I'm going to make an argument a bit later on that the theme of this chapter is actually all about assurance. Assurance of one's salvation through Jesus Christ. Christ. We are aware, each one of us here, that we cannot save ourselves. We should actually be very glad that we cannot save ourselves, but rather that salvation is all through Jesus Christ. Now we know that we cannot uh, save ourselves because we are dead in trespasses and sins. We have committed sins against an infinite God. And we have nothing in and of ourselves, in our natural conditions, that is lovely to bring to God. We would be like a child going and saying, I'm going to get a really nice present for my parents. Oh, you mean well, yeah, go and get a really nice present for my parents, but it was my mum. Go going into the alleyways, picking up all of the different things that you can find and putting something together. And you take it to your mother and she says, oh, well, thank you very much, but this is actually no good because it's, you've got on here some poison ivy, you've got on here some stinging nettles and some thistles and that, some other really not nice things in there and it's all going to be completely got rid of. And that is like trying to amass our own righteousness, our own good works, whatever other kind of uh, actions or um, our, even our own uh, reliefs if they're not founded in the word of God, that would be what that would be like trying to bring something to God. And we know that these things are worthless and actually dangerous if we think that we can be saved by them. But because we are not saved by ourselves at all, but rather we are saved by Jesus Christ, we cannot cease to be saved. Christ's salvation is complete and sufficient for each one of us. We uh, know that we cannot atone for our sins. We know that we have, even if we were to say, well, from now on, I'm going to try and live that perfect life, that we would fail. And even if we could somehow muster up a perfect life, from now on, we've still got a vast number of sins in the past to atone for. And this is, of course, central to the gospel, something that we uh, are aware of. Previous guilt. But do we realize that this previous guilt is also an infinite De debt, an infinite debt, because it is, it is committed against an infinite God and his infinite holiness. And therefore, it uh, is something that we can never, even if we could amass a whole host of good things to bring to God, never be quite enough. We understand that, you know, the court of law, when somebody is um, brought before the the magistrate and they are sentenced, that they will be sentenced according to the severity of their crime. So somebody who's caught speeding and they're 
the camera goes off, they, they get a letter through the, the post um, a couple of weeks later perhaps, uh, you caught you speeding, there's a fine of a hundred pounds and three points on your license. And then if you were to move, however, that speeding to outside of a school, you would imagine that the penalty would be more. If you were, while you were speeding, to hit somebody, then there would be a greater uh, penalty to pay, a greater sentence to pay, possibly even some um, time in prison. Well, magnify that against God and against his infinite holiness, and it is, we see then, an infinite debt that we owe to God. And therefore, we cannot save ourselves, neither can anybody else of a natural, natural man save us. It would be like somebody saying to you, well, the fine that you've been given is um, time in prison or a million pounds, and I'll pay, you, uh, pay for you the a million pounds. And so you say, oh, thank you very much, I'll let you just pay that a million pounds to me, and uh, they, um, then you just leave them to it. And then a couple of weeks later, you hear a knocking on the door, and who is it who's knocking on the door? It is the police saying that the penalty has not been paid. Why? Because you did not consider that this person who said they would pay the million pounds perhaps didn't even have two pennies to put together, didn't have a penny to his name, did not, was not able to pay the debt anyway. And so it is those who trust in the works of other men find that these are severely lacking. But Christ is not like those other men. He's not like uh, Hayes Russell or um, Joseph Smith or um, the Buddha or any of these other people who men might rely on to try and save them. Christ is completely and utterly different. He is, of course, the Son of God, and therefore he is able to pay that infinite debt on our behalf. And therefore, we can have assurance that his death on the cross is sufficient for us. If we have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone to save us, then we can have assurance that Christ has indeed saved us. And he has been successful in his mission to save us. After all, was Christ ever not able to overcome? Did he ever fail in anything that he ever did. Um, we, was it that he came to a, a, an individual and the individual said, I'm, I, I'm suffering, there's this, uh, I can't uh, see, I'm completely blind, and Jesus Christ tries to go out, reach out and cure the blindness <coughs> in that individual. And yet, he says, oh, I, I don't understand, why is it not working? Why can't I cure this individual's blindness? Of course, Christ always was able to, when he uh, set out to do something, to accomplish it. And Christ set out to accomplish for us salvation. He set out to defeat uh, sin, death, and hell, which he did upon the cross. He even rose then from the grave. And this is what Romans uh, 8 will go on to say in verse um, uh, 34. It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even now at the right hand of God. So Christ always conquered. And that, I've been laying down then that foundation of the gospel because this is really what the entire book of Romans is all about. It's Paul's master exposition of the gospel. After his introduction in the first 15 verses of chapter 1, he goes to say, um, for I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to all who believe, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, that the right, for the righteousness of God is revealed from heaven against the all unrighteousness of God and godly men, um, and for the wrath of God is revealed against as, as well. And he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, and he goes on to expound the gospel then over the next few chapters. He says it's for the Jews and for the Greeks, and he reverses that order to speak firstly about how it is for the Greeks or the, the Gentiles. And uh, the Gentiles need the gospel, he says in, in Romans 1, 18 to 32. And this is why they need it, because they are dead in their sins, because they are those who chase after their own lusts. They are malicious, they are proud, they are un, 
trustworthy, unmerciful, unloving. And then he says, but you Jews don't think that you also are, that you are, not, you are fine, that you are, have got the, the law of the Old Testament because actually that's not uh, going to save you. Yes, it might be a benefit that you've got the law in the Old Testament. But in chapters 2 and 3, he expands it. He says, no, this Jesus Christ is the way that you need to be saved as well. And in chapter 3 in particular, he talks about the benefit of, uh, or in chapter 2, he talks about the benefit of the Old Testament law. In chapter 3, he talks, says, faith alone is what you need in Jesus Christ, and he will therefore save you. He goes on to say, this has always been the case. This has always been the case that, consider even Abraham. Abraham, the father of the faith, faithful, the father of the nation of, of, of the Israelites. He was saved also by faith. And in chapters 5 to 8, so bringing us to our chapter as well, he's, Paul lays down these evidences, these, um, these uh, signs, these um, things that prove the finality, the fullness, and the absolute certainty of salvation. So the first ground of our finality, uh, fullness, and absolute certainty of salvation is our union with Jesus Christ. And the second ground of our finality, fullness, and absolute certainty of salvation is that we have the Spirit of God dwelling in us. And the third, that third ground of the finality, fullness, and absolute certainty of salvation is that God has so decreed it. And in chapter 9, he will go on to show that this was always God's purpose, that he should save individuals according to his decree. So what do we see there? We see then that this is a threefold bond, that we have union with Christ and the Spirit and the, and, and, and the Father. So the Son, the Spirit, and the Father. A threefold bond. Jesus even alludes to this or speaks, says it quite explicitly, rather, in uh, John chapter 10, where he says um, that he keeps us, nobody is able to pluck us out of his hand, and his Father... No, is also going to hold us, and nobody able, is able to pluck us out of the Father's hand. So it is that the gospel it needs to be known, and we rejoice in the gospel. And we have, of course, our weekly gospel service to make this known. We tell the gospel to the youngest individual as well. In the Sunday school and in the youth club, we are those who, I'm sure, take the gospel to our friends and our families because we know that it is by the gospel that an individual is saved. It's not by keeping the law, for example. As we said uh, already that Paul wants to help the Jews to understand, it's not by keeping the law. You thought that by keeping the law you could be saved. But in Romans uh, chapter 7, he says the law brings about death. In fact, he even mentions it a little bit at the beginning of chapter 8. Rather, instead, the law reveals our sins. It acts like a mirror to hold, we hold up against us. We can see them where those spots and where those blemishes, where those faults and failings are. And in fact, because we can now see where they are, if we do not respond to them, it only adds to our transgression. This is an argument that Paul makes. He says, Basically, like a parent said, said when, they, when their child, their younger child does something, they say, well, they didn't know any better, and now they're going to learn, and I'm going to instruct them that that's not how they should behave, because, you know, they've misbehaved. But when they get a little bit older, the parent doesn't say, oh, well, they didn't know any better. Says, no, you should have known better. You should have known that that's not something that you should do. Well, the law then is saying, here you go, here's what you shouldn't do, here's what you should do. And if you fail, you should know better because you have the law before you. But that is a fault of men then, not keeping the law, and not the fault of the law. And Paul likes that, to stress that. But of course, many people think that they can keep the law or that they can do something. Oh yes, by my good deeds, by my, my uh, actions, I can save myself. And I'm going to set myself a personal standard that I'm going to try and to hold to. I want a little bit of reform in my life, you know, to get a little bit better, but don't often even meet that personal standard that we like to set 
ourselves. And because we behave in such a way, we just become more guilty. The Jehovah's Witnesses, then they like to rely upon the number of hours that they put on standing on their boards or the number of doors they knock on or the number of leaflets they post through those doors. And but they always have then this fear. Have I done enough hours? Have I posted enough uh, leaflets? Have I knocked on enough doors? The Mormons rely upon their ceremonies and they're going on mission work. And they can always then ask themselves, have I, commit, have I done enough ceremonies? Have I gone through enough ceremonies? Have I uh, been faithful enough in these mission works? Even the Roman Catholic has a little bit of a problem because he relies upon uh, the, the, the church. He puts his faith entirely upon praying certain things and doing certain things, praying, giving, fasting. Has he done enough of those things? Have he, has he prayed enough? Has he forgiven enough? Has he fasted enough? Has he uh, done all that he should do? Has he been faithful enough to the church? Well, there is a fear, perhaps, that even the evangelicals at uh, faith, that is, have we repented enough? Have we, in our repentance, felt enough sorrow for our sins? Have we repented in a, enough time? Have we been sincere in our repentance? And what about our faith? Do we have enough faith? Have we believed enough? Have we, um, have we failed to put our trust in God at some time or another? Well, I want to direct us to not look into ourselves, but instead in unto Christ. We don't rely upon ourselves. We shouldn't even rely upon, really, our repentance or our faith. But we should be relying entirely upon the work of Jesus Christ and what he did for us there upon the cross. That he completed the work of salvation. And if it's a completed work of salvation, then we can be assured that we will certainly be saved and never cease being saved. This is our ground of assurance then, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I said I was going to put forward to you that Romans 8 is all about then assurance and it's about this work of salvation because there are those who say that Romans 8 is about sanctification. Although you can see certain marks and aspects of sanctification in this chapter, really it is a chapter that points us outside of ourselves and towards God and saying here is what God has done for us, here is what God has accomplished for us. And so we should be encouraged because we are saved then by God and not by our sanctification, not by us becoming Better, although as Christians we should be being conformed ever more to the image of Jesus Christ. And we know that that work is completed when we shall see him, for we shall become like him, for we shall see him as he is. It's my favourite verse in the Bible, John, uh, 1 John uh, 3 verse 2 says, In Romans 8, uh, Paul also this um, special uh, season of assurance, this special uh, example, which is the spirit bearing witness with our spirits that we are children of God. Here is what it says in uh, chapter 8, verse 16. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we also uh, may also be glorified together. This is a special season of blessing when the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we feel almost him whispering to us, yes, you are a son of God. Yes, you are one of God's uh, beloved. It would be um, like similarly, but not this is not a perfect image, but you can imagine a child and he believes his parent loves him, and he believes that his parent cares for him. And how does that child get that special assurance? Well, it's when, actually, just almost out of the blue, the parent comes up to him, gives him a massive hug, and tells him he loves him. And that is, similarly, 
what the Spirit does in bearing witness with our spirit. So Calvin, it says the, that the uh, assurance of salvation is the birthright of all believers. Because we are fickle, we miss out at times. Some, uh, therefore, do lack assurance, and we might be those who struggle with this assurance of salvation, assurance of being loved by God, and being those who are indeed God's children. Well, why? Why might we lack it? Why might we never gain it to any strong degree? Well, because perhaps there's natural tendencies to doubts and fears, and we should be those then who cry out like the Father in Mark chapter 9, which we considered in our uh, in our prayer meeting actually, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. Wouldn't it be good actually if every one of us was to cry out, no matter how strong our assurance and how strong our faith is, Lord, help my unbelief. Because who ever attains to perfect belief in this lifetime? So this natural tendency, which we should pray for to be overcome, that the Spirit might indeed help us to overcome our natural inclinations to fears and doubts and worries and anxieties. The other uh, issue that we might face is this idea of a tender conscience. Now, we should, of course, cultivate a tender conscience, being uh, aware of sin and opposed to sin, making careful uh, note to avoid sin in all of its uh, various ways. But we can perhaps have a tender conscience which is too concerned over our personal sins in this way that doubts then, that doubts then our salvation. How can I be saved when I behave in such a way? How can I be saved when I fall into various sins? How can I be saved if I fall into that sin? Not just once or twice, but a few times. Such a person is should be reminded that Paul uh, says elsewhere that Christ died for the chief of sinners. He calls himself the chief of, chief of sinners and says that Christ died for him. He also cry, cries out earlier in uh, Romans 8, so, Wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And be reminded that even in such a situation, if we have trusted in Jesus Christ, then God has willingly already set his love upon us. His love is already set upon us, that we are his children. So there are those who perhaps then have strong feelings, these changeable feelings, these misleading feelings, which can be guided by all kinds of things. And then in the morning we feel one way, we feel happy, you know, we're ready for the day, and then something happens, it knocks us sideways, and we just can't concentrate anymore. And we, we feel this even in our Christian walk at times, just being knocked by various trials and tribulations and finding it a struggle to see the love of God or to n experience or to know that God is indeed for us. Well, we should, of course, be mindful that feelings should not govern everything. And feelings are, are important, but they are subservient to truth, to God's truth. Then there are those who also lack feelings or have feelings that are cold. And just naturally, they're quite a, um, stern and solemn individuals and these individuals who don't really uh, lean too much into feelings. And they, might, they might wonder, have I ever felt enough? Have I ever felt enough? Have I ever hated that sin? I wish that I could hate this sin more. I wish that I could uh, have a stronger uh, hatred for all kinds of sins. See sins as God sees sins. Well, that's quite a good sign, actually, that you want to see sins as God sees sins, that you want to hate God's sins more and hate sins more, because... The unbeliever doesn't care about hating their sins. They might feel uncomfortable about certain things, but a hatred of sins or a desire to hate sins more and more is a sign that something is, uh, that there is a witnessing of the Spirit within you. 
What about wanting to love God more? Oh, I don't love God as much as I should love God. I don't love Jesus Christ as much as I should love Jesus Christ. How can I be a believer if I don't have this great love? Oh, that my cold heart were more on fire for God. Well, again, an unbeliever has no concern for loving God or for a lack of any love that he might experience towards God. He might not be able to sing at this moment, and the fairest of 10,000 in my blessed Lord I see. But have we been able to sing it in the past? Have we known Jesus Christ to be that fairest of 10,000? And indeed, is that not our usual standing? But too often we walk by sight and not by faith. And the Bible tells us, of course, to do the opposite. Walk by faith, not by sight. But we walk by sight, not by faith. And so we lack. What is it that we believe? It's not what we can see, but what is it that we believe? Who have we trusted? It is, of course, Jesus Christ, whom we have trusted with our salvation. And if we have trusted Jesus Christ with our salvation, we are most certainly saved. Well, you might have heard of various uh, signs of conversions, and these are uh, jolly good. These can be helpful to us. These, after all, if we are children of uh, God, we should resemble uh, a God in some ways. And a child naturally would resemble his parent. He's inherited those um, those characteristics, you talk about this baby and you look at this baby and you go, oh look, he's got his father's eyes or his nose or his ears or, or you can tell whose son that is and as you get older you even find some of the mannerisms of the parents being copied out in their child, aren't you? A child resembles their parent, there's that family resemblance. Well, are we being conformed ever more to the image of Jesus Christ and to how Jesus Christ was, if we've been informed in, in that way. And that's a really good first sign of a genuine work of salvation in our life, that we are becoming more like Christ in the way that we fight and conquer against sin. Of course, Jesus Christ never fell into sin, not even one time, though we may stumble. Do we find this decreasing pattern of sin in our life? Are we finding that we're victorious over sin? And do we desire to conquer our sin more and more? But then you come to that backslidden Christian, that backslidden believer. They are a believer, they are a Christian, but they go through this time, this period, where they have fallen and where they seem to keep on falling. And actually, an individual might rely, uh, might lie in this uh, situation for a few years. They will come out of it, but they might lie there for a few years. They keep on falling. But of course, it's a fall. It's a fall into something. It's a fall from something. Is it characterised, and it are our lives, in fact, even if we are not in such a backslidden state, are they characterised by this attitude of constant repentance? This repentance to uh, God for our sins. And we know that if we are backslidden, that we can be restored, that we are not lost. And we should cry out evermore, oh, Father, help me to come out of this pit that I seem to have got myself into. Because a true believer cannot dwell then in that pit. They cannot dwell in that sorry state. They have fallen there. They have fallen from, not from the family of God, not from this um, uh, state of grace, but fallen into this miry pit. And they are struggling against it. And struggling is a sign of life. Struggling is a, a good sign of life. If you tr try and take a dead body somewhere that that person would have not wanted to go to when they were alive, it would be very easy. You just lift the body up and you take it there and there it goes. But if that person is alive, then they will struggle against you. And they will do all that they can to try and stop you from taking them to where they do not want to go. They've got life in them. They might end up there, but they did not go there willingly. 
And do we hate our sins? As I've already said, as Paul also says, a wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? We agree then with God. We agree with God. We say, sin is terrible. I wish that I could be free from my sin entirely. We are not then dead in sins. We are not then dead in sins. We are instead alive in the Lord Jesus Christ. We can be assured then that we are a son of God, that we have salvation. That's the first sign, decreasing pattern of sin and the hatred of sins. And the next sec- second one is the conviction of these sins and the confession of them. And we've uh, considered this uh, recently in 1 John 1. I guess I've just lost my place now. 1 John 1 and uh, verse uh, 9. It says, um, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, he is he will forgive us them. So we know our sins, first of all. We know that there are many sins in us, and we are sorry for them. But there are those who have different reasons for reform, different reasons for wanting to be rid of their sins. Oh, I don't like the way I feel when I commit them. A little bit uncomfortable, and uh, what will others think about me if they were to be able to find out the way that I live my life at times? But instead, for the believer, is the way that God views them. I do not like my sins because God is grieved over my sins. I do not like my sins because they mean that I am not acting in the way that God would have me act. The world doesn't care about this. The world views God as austere and unreasonable. He is more like a tyrant to the world than than like a loving father. Was Henry VIII obeyed? Well, yes, Henry VIII was obeyed because he was feared. He was a tyrant king who was feared and obeyed. Was David, King David, obeyed? Yes, because he was loved. And you can even think of Jonathan, who should have, according to the natural way that things should go, or things went, and things still go, that Jonathan, who should have naturally been the very next king, said, I'm willing for David to become king, and for David to be the next king, and I'm going to be one of his most ardent supporters and followers. Of course, he never actually lined up like this, but that's a different story, uh, because, of course, he didn't, uh, he he was killed before David became the king. Um, Why was Jonathan like that in regard to David? Because he loved David, because David, of course, was godly and somebody who um, was kind and compassionate. When we uh, love God, then, we love to obey God and not to grieve him. It is more um, grievous in a relationship when the one whom you love most of all suffers, than even when you yourself suffer. So that's our third sign, I suppose you could say. There's two signs there, the the confession of sin, and also this love for God, that we want to obey him and not grieve him. And this love also then shows itself, fourthly, in the communication with God. We have the Bible before us, and we view it, as our pastor often says, like a love letter. This word is alive to us. It is God's word. It is great. It is wonderful. We, we want to read it, to understand it, to know who God is, and to make sure that we can follow him as best as we can. We don't view it as perhaps those who study it in universities do, as some kind of great rhetoric or some kind of historical document. And you know, it's got some really interesting uh, morals in there and really interesting stories, and so we like it for them, but no, it's for us instead. It is a a personal, sweet guide for our life. And when we hear its guidance, we do not argue against it, but want to be conformed to it. So we love God. In fact, I heard this saying recently, that we are most like Christ when we love the Father, And we are most like the Father when we love Christ. 
And the fifth sign that's often put forward is this love then also for the believers. This is what uh, we read in John chapter 13. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, you all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Here's a challenge. Could we be convicted in a court of law as being Christians because of the love that we have for one another? Could we be convicted in a court of law as being Christians for the love that we have for one another? Uh, James says that, uh, of course, this love isn't just saying, I'll be warmed and filled, but also giving them the things that you need. So showing this love as well, this outworking of this this love. But of course, this love for the believer is a love because, particularly to them, because in them we see Christ. And we know that Christ has loved them. And we are united to them because we have the same faith, the same birth, the same Lord. Where do we most love to be? In the world, doing worldly things with worldly people or with God's people. Where are we most comfortable? And this love also extends then in charitable uh, ways outside of the family of faith. But of course, charity can also be performed by others who are not believers. But it is particularly seen at Christians, for those who have started a large number of charities and uh, hospitals and education, the like. So we love one another. We also, and also in, in our love, which extends then to not loving the things of the world, but treasuring up things in heaven, having treasures laid up for us in heaven, and not being uh, concerned over much for this earth, longing instead for heaven and not for things of this earth. That's the sixth sign. And seventhly, we cannot shut up about Christ. We love to keep on talking about Christ. We love who Christ is. We love the whole Christ. We love him in all circumstances. Uh, we love Christ while it is easy and when it is hard. And when for all intents and purposes, it should be impossible to love him. We love him when we have much and when we have little. We love him when we're on cloud nine or when we're in the depths of despair. We love him when we are full of the vigor of youth and when we are on our sick beds. The believer loves to exalt Christ even before unbelievers and enemies. Well, these are the seven signs. And really this week is acting like an introduction because we're going to go on to uh, see that the greatest sign, and we will touch on this just now for a little bit, the greatest sign is the fact that we are children of God because of the glorious gospel. This text before us, verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Um, it's God really bursting out. In light of this glorious gospel that Jesus Christ died for us, that he laid down his life for us, and all that, that it involves, and all of the thing, uh, all of the pain and the suffering that he went through. And in light of the Spirit coming and working in our life, if God is for us, who can be against us? Now, many may stand against us. There may be those who are our enemies who like to come and stand against us, and we can see this in society and the way that the world has always treated those who are of the household of faith. But we are always more numerous than we are when we are with God. We might be one against the world, but we outnumber the world because we have God on our side. So it might have been Athanasius contra Mundum, or Athanasius against the world in the 300s, him alone basically standing for the deity of Christ. And yet he was in the right. And history shows that he's in the right. And we today remember Athanasius for the stand that he took. And he had God then on his side. He kept him safe even through four different exiles and through the attempt on his life through bringing him to a court of law in the way that God remarkably brought that about that 
he wasn't put to death. And that's a story perhaps you can ask me about. It's a, quite a humorous story as well. It's just something that God does have then a sense of humor and he does care for us in remarkable ways and sometimes really rather odd ways. And this is shown in the, in the being of God and who God is. And if God is this infinite and omnipotent God, it is no wonder that, that we are saved and we are kept safe. God is not a superman. He's not, a, he's not just uh, uh, the best of men times by a, a million. He's infinite. He has no beginning and no end. He's omnipotent. He has no end to his power. And this is the God who is for us. This is the God who is for us. Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? We have this most amazing God, the one who created all things and created even those who stand something against us. But how do we know that God is for us? Well, of course, the Bible gives us plenty of reasons to know. And if we look back on our lives, we have plenty of examples to know as well that God is for us. The Bible lets us know, and it say, in this it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we have, of course, the invitation that the Lord Jesus Christ himself gave. Come unto me, all you who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. These are promises that God makes. And God, of course, is unable to break any of his promises. He has covenanted indeed together with us that we should be his people. Well, God is not just for us. He is all for us. The Westminster Confession of Faith uh, says that um, God uh, does not have um, body parts, uh, passions, um, it's just something like that, but it's basically it says at this particular point of the Westminster Confession of Faith that there's a whole God, and that God is uh, simple. What do you mean simple? The simplicity of God. We mean that he's not made up of lots of different parts. So the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question four, four asks, uh, what is God? Well, God is a spirit, uh, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. These aren't just attributes that you add up together and, you know, eventually once you add them all up together, it's like putting them in a bowl and add them up together, what you come out with in the end, you come out with God. Now, these are just ways that God expresses himself. These are God's attributes. He is not the sum of these. He is, in fact, completely and utterly holy and just and good and righteous and true all the time. And in all of these ways, then, he is always holy, indivisibly for us. There's got to be an outworking of that because he is also gracious and loving and kind and compassionate. And whom has he decided to express his kindness, goodness, compassion and mercy to? Well, it is to his people. So we always fall under the infinite love of God, the entirety of the being of God being always all for us. Well, how do we know that God is for us. This we have in verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? How do we know? Well, we're not only told, but we are also shown. He did not spare his own son. And the Bible puts it elsewhere like this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How do we know the love of God? While we were yet sinners, he gave Christ for us. Christ was not spared because God had decided to set his infinite love upon us. The Father uh, grieved when Christ was on the cross suffering because, of course, he saw that all of the sins were being laid upon his beloved son. And he had to turn his face away. And this in itself must have also further grieved him. 
It was not a small thing for the father to deliver up Jesus Christ to the cross. We often thank God, uh, the son, and praise God, the son, and remember God, the son's sacrifice upon the cross, and rightly so, for all that he suffered. But do we also think about the fact that this is the father willingly giving his son for us? This is what Matthew Henry said. He did not spare his own son that served him, that he might spare us, though we have done him so much disservice. No, instead, it pleased the Father to make Christ sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. It pleased God to bruise him, as you read in Isaiah 53, verse 10. It pleased the Father to set this high, high price for us and have it paid for by his son. Um, have it paid for by the Father uh, in this way that he gave his son. He spared him not, that not one drop of penalty, not one drop of sin is left for us to pay. If there was one drop left, it would be impossible for us to be saved. So he gave him up that he might have an effectual death. We've already mentioned that it was impossible for, of course, the Son to fail. It was impossible for God to fail. It was impossible for him to set this plan of salvation out and then not be able to accomplish it. It seems that Satan was so blinded by his pride that he acted in a rather mad way and thought that he had been able to conquer over God. But on those days where Christ was, or that moment when Christ was um, dead, where he, he gave up his spirit, that Satan thought he'd actually won. But how long did that victory last in his mind? Well, not very long at all. This plan then was put forward that man, men must be saved and Christ actually bore an actual penalty for actual sins. This is what we're told in 1 Peter, in chapter 2, in verse um, 21 to 20, uh, 25, really, it says this in 1 Peter chapter 2. For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on a tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. There was Christ then, we see, bearing the whole judgment in its effectual death for our sins. And he must be infinitely successful. We already said that it was an infinite penalty that he had to bear when he died upon the cross because it was against the infinite holiness of God that we sinned. Uh, so, the fact that there is not a sin left to pay means that Christ suffered an infinite penalty. How is that possible in such a short period of time? And how is it possible for him who was on the cross to suffer? Well, because, of course, as we sing in one of our uh, Christmas uh, hymns, is God contracted to a span incomprehensibly made man. And because the penalty was that the infinite was separated in this way from the from the infinite. It, it was the son in experience on there on the cross being separated from the father. A mystery that means that this infinite penalty can be completely and utterly paid for. I wonder if you 
come to see this third consequence. I laid out the fact that the first consequence, that there's not one drop left and that Christ died upon the cross. This first consequence must be that there's an effectual death. The so second consequence is that it must be infinitely successful. A third consequence of this is he must have died for specific people. He must have died for a specific people. If Christ had died for all the sins of all men, then all men must of necessity be saved. Because there would not be anything left for a single man to atone for, including the sin of unbelief. Because unbelief is a sin, it must be atoned for. And if Christ did also die on the cross to, uh, to save us from our unbelief, then if he did that for everybody, then everybody would be saved. Unless Christ, of course, didn't die for unbelief, but died for all our other sins, well, then we have a problem. Because then our unbelief can never be paid for. Even if you, even if you genuinely believe, now you can't work up belief in yourself, this is another matter for a different time, but even if you could, from this moment, or from the moment you say believe, you still have your, all of your unbelief beforehand that you cannot atone for. So, there would be none saved if Christ left just unbelief to be paid for, just left to pay. So then, Christ must have actually died for actual sins of an actual group of people whom he foreknew and whom the Father was going to give to his Son. And this is the agreement that we have in between the Father and the Son past, before even the world came into being, that the Father said to the Son, this is the people that I'm going to give to you if you are willing to go down to the cross, uh, go down to earth and to go onto the cross and to die for the sins of this group of people, and then you can purchase their, 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 you can purchase their salvation. And the Son says, I am willing to die for these people, my people, whom you have set aside for me. And so, a fourth consequence is that not one of these people for whom Christ died could possibly be lost. God has, is the one who delivered up his son. He set him aside for the work, knowing full well for whom Christ would be coming to die for. Even more, sovereignly electing them, as we just said. And the son came, knowing full well for those for whom he was going to die. And he experienced the wrath of God for each sin. And as each sin was paid for, then not one ounce of God's wrath is left for us to bear. And if we've got nothing left to bear, then we cannot be lost. And so this must be so for all of those for whom Christ died. Hence God delivered up Christ for us all, as the passage says. Uh, fifthly, as we are then completely saved by the Father, uh, completely saved, the Father must love us in a way compar comparable to his love for the Son. So let me say that again. We are, if we are completely saved, the Father must love us in a way comparable to his love to the Son. This is what Paul goes on to say. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? As Paul has already said, we have this union with Christ. And that from that out, out flow out these abounding blessings. And as Paul has said in this very chapter, we are children of God, and so heirs, heirs with God, and greater joint heirs with Christ. So as Christ receives the blessings of the Father, so we receive the blessings of the Father. And not merely because, um, not merely because we have Christ that we are given them, but in Christ they are given to us. He gives all things freely. There is no reluctance in God to get, provide good gifts to his children. And that includes this good gift of assurance of faith because the son has died 
for us completely. He has paid the penalty that we so rightly deserve to pay. And therefore, we can never be lost. We can never be separated from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord, as the chapter ends. Therefore, God may very well provide the special blessing that we mentioned, that witness of the Spirit. He may bring to our recollection some previous experience or he may help us to remember those specific evidences of salvation that we considered. But in particular, he brings to our mind this great truth, particularly when we reflect upon his word and we read it, that he is for us, that he did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us. And he is the provider of all things for us. And may this be the thing that encourages us and helps us in our assurance that we can go on day by day serving such a loving and faithful God. Amen.